is Adam from Loose Pixel, and today I have the pleasure of sharing with you my thoughts and feelings on this book over here, The Art of Horizon Zero Dawn. Now this is the first book that I've actually purchased for doing book reviews. Every book that I've covered so far on my channel have been books that I already pre-owned, but my cart is full of books that have been suggestion from you guys, so a huge thank you to you for that. And I'm very excited that you're really enjoying this series, that I'm making it a regular part of my channel. It started off as just something I wanted to do for fun, and now, screw it, let's have fun with this. Now, before I continue, I think I owe you guys a bit of a, <laughs> maybe a bit of an apology or explanation, at least to you guys who are eagle-eyed enough to have caught my mistake. I posted a video earlier this week called Test Video, which is basically a very awkward video of me just kind of staring at the screen and looking at the catch light in my eyes and, going like this and and I didn't realize I had posted it until 15 minutes after the fact and I started getting all these weird yet very considerate <laughs> uh, uh, comments on my video going uh, you know nice set and you know showing off your handsome face and all these different types of things really sweet comments as you can read right here um, but of course it was a, supposed to be a private video my dyslexic self didn't take enough time to distinguish between P for public and P for private and posted it. Thankfully, I wasn't doing anything too embarrassing in the video, minus just being very strange. But yeah, that wasn't intentional. So thank you for being such good sports about it. Now, before I move forward, before I start talking about this book, what's really important is even if I'm purchasing books for this channel uh, to do discussions and reviews and, and whatnot, um, I'm only going to be sharing with you books that I feel aren't just beautiful art books, but books that actually have a takeaway from it. The reason I purchase and keep books for myself is because it inspires, it motivates me, it teaches me. There's something for me to gain and benefit from, and that's the only reason why I want to do these book reviews for you, or at least book discussions, um, that there's something for you to benefit from it. And this book, Horizon Zero Dawn, based on the game, of course, if you haven't played it, it's a PlayStation exclusive. This game really, really took me by surprise because I really wasn't looking for it. It wasn't one of those games I was sitting around waiting for, patiently tapping my foot on the floor, <coughs> Elden Ring. Um, it was, I just kind of saw it, watched a couple of reviews, it looked cool, and I started to play it. And I was blown away. Not only at the, the fantastic gameplay, the, the stealth mechanic and the gathering and the gear progression and the combat, but the beauty, the design. Oh my God, it is such a beautiful game. It's not only fun, but it's gorgeous to play. And it just kept being gorgeous and it kept being fun throughout the entire game. So, you know, if you're on the fence whether or not to play the game, get it. I'm sure you can get it for dirt cheap now, but Let's break this open. Let's break this beautiful bad boy open and start to look inside. Now, the first few pages are going to kind of throw you off. You're kind of, I'm going to flip through the first little section of this book just to kind of give you an overview. But uh, the first few pages are a little confusing, minus this one. Kind of gives you an idea of the ruins and the landscape. Very reminiscent of uh, the God of War book, which you can check out right here. Um, but the other thing that you're going to see is as you start to flip through it, this, I don't know what this is about. It's cool. But if it's trying to set an expectation, I don't think it is because this doesn't exist in the game. There's no, this doesn't exist in the game. So I don't know. I don't know what it was about, but it's cool to look at. This is more what you're going to see, more tribal landscapes, kind of like the old world type of thing. The whole design aesthetic behind this game is old meets new. It's old tribal landscapes juxtaposed next to futuristic mechanics and, and robotics and stuff like that. They did such a damn good job at that too. The director, uh, Jan Bart van Beek. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Oh yeah, and on my God of War video, I'm sorry, I kept saying Ray. I even wrote Ray Grissetti. It's Raph Grissetti. I apologize for that. Raphael. But uh, you can see this juxtaposition. Now you're also going to notice if you saw see my Game of Thrones book review, which you can check out right here as well. Um, a heavy use of photo bashing, but in the Game of Thrones book, um, in the Game of Thrones book, 
uh, it showed just how much work they had to produce because they had to sacrifice aesthetics and rendering and, and refinement for the sake of just getting those designs out really quickly. In this particular case, there's a lot of photo, you're gonna see a lot of photo work in it, but not at the expense of artistry. They really rendered out some beautiful pieces. Now this of course is fully illustrated, but you're gonna notice that as well. But may it be a lesson to you that that photo bashing is not a supplement for your necessity to learn and train in the fundamentals of art, right? You still have to be able to produce great art, but photo bashing can sometimes help speed up that process. Alloy, named after metal because it's based off of robotics. A very pretty woman's name, I might add. That's a really pretty name. I really, really liked her as a, as a character, as a play character, and I like the fact that she was uh, believable, credible, and fun to play female hero character, AKA heroine. She was feminine yet badass at the same time. And I like that sometimes it kind of tips the scales too much in one direction or another. The young version of this character, I thought a little weird in the game. She seemed a bit big headed, <laughs> bit disproportionate. Thankfully she doesn't last very long. Uh, here, a very photo bashed, but very pretty. Just kind of a nice atmospheric piece. Some quick weapon designs, just to kind of get us a little bit more acquainted with the character herself. Some different costume designs, really beautiful stuff. The target dummy. I'm gonna flip through this. This is where we start to get into her particular clan, uh, the Nora Society. Um, and they're saying here a very matriarchal society, AKA run and governed by women, which is reflects in Alloy, the fact that she's the warrior. She's the, she's the warrior of the, uh, a warrior of the clan, but I don't wanna give away too much of the story how she gets there and all that kind of stuff because that's an important part of the story. But you can see whenever you kind of have a neutral race or a neutral society, it's very often the most quote human of them all. Think of humans in Lord of the Rings. What kind of a design aesthetic are they using? It's usually very neutralized. The forms aren't too stylized, it, but you're getting an idea of the colors that make them unique. And they use this very, you'll notice that in, in, uh, in Horizon Zero Dawn, they use colors to help to distinguish not only different clans and different tribes, but also stature, their political standing, their temperament. You're gonna see that as we move forward. A Couple of shots of the locations. Again, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much because I wanna get into this. There's something in particular I really wanna tap on today and get an idea of their architecture. Very familiar looking huts, stylized a little bit, but not too much. Religious, there's a religion that plays a very important role. They all have their own kind of gods and their own types of belief systems and stuff and that reflects in their design aesthetic. Just giving you a little idea of their lifestyle. This is where they kind of have gatherings where they give speeches and presentations and stuff like that. The shrines. Here's another very cool tip. Design props. Drawing props is a lot of fun and it can very often give you a little bit more insight and it can allow you to dig a little bit deeper into specific cultures bags, weapons, forks and knives, tables, windows, door frames, things like that. That can really help to inform your design. Very powerful tool. Then we get into our first tribe. This is where I wanna start paying a little bit more attention. The Karja tribe are known as being the most elegant, the most noble, the most wealthy. So the first impression that you get of the Karja is through their design aesthetic. The use, particularly in the Karja, you're gonna see this very colorful, a little bit flamboyant, very bird designs, they kind of have the wing designs. But look at how that design aesthetic translates into their personality, their pose, their facial expressions. Notice how they kind of all, all have nice tans, they're all calm, they're all relaxed, shoulders down, very elegant, high quality, clean fabrics. The warriors are very, very sleek, very stealthy. Kind of has a bit of a Metal Gear Solid type of ins I'd say Metal Gear Solid slash Zelda influenced a little bit in their design aesthetic. I love this. This is probably one of my favorite designs in the entire book over here. I just, so clever with the, th that beautiful helmet, the kind of op little peepholes with the two things that come down the cheeks, almost like, looks like, almost like bulldog cheeks. Love that. Very centered. Again, the pose is a reflection of the culture. They're not just in these neutral, poses like that, their pose actually helps to inform the design choice. Warriors, very agile, very spry, springing height, speed, archers, assassins with the daggers, rogues. The royalty, 
the religious side of things, heavy use of red, culture. Different cultures, remember that there's a certain iconography, there's a certain association we make with different cultures. Different cultures in our lives today, not in the fantasy world, uh, have very often different colors that, that they tend to reference with different things. For instance, royalty or nobility or authority in China is very often described using strong red colors, where in North America, you're more likely to get navy dark blues, which is kind of translating into blacks now because police officers now wear SWAT outfits for some strange reason. Dark, dark blue. If you look royal, think of royalty, purples, right? So we have an already, we have an already association with these things and you can tap into this iconography to help to establish certain cultural elements in your designs very quickly and effectively. So the heavy use of red shows both wealth and power. Structures, high up, verticality, Think of uh, uh, Minas Tirith, for instance. Think about churches. The St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal is on the top of a mountain. It's very high up. And it's actually, by law, they're not allowed. There's a, there's a construction limitation. They're not allowed to build any skyscrapers higher than the oratory itself. The oratory in Montreal has to be the highest structure in the city. That's where I'm from, by the way, Montreal, if you're curious. Kind of walking through the town square and stuff like that, getting a little a bit of an idea of kind of the, the back alleys and stuff like that. The docks, again, very elaborate, very detailed, very overly designed structures. Think of Game of Thrones. What does this make you think of? The moment you see flowers and golden light, you make immediately make an association with vanity, pruning, elegance, richness, right? So these little flowers are important design elements in conjunction with all the other design elements. Here, this looks more like a gladiator, gladiator kind of arena, very iconic gladiator type of thing. Oh, that's more of the hallways where all the market squares. This makes me think of Jurassic Park, their museum, with these cool kind of LED lights. That's cool, I love it. I want lights like that. I want, see if I can find one for here. Religion, again, red, power, verticality. Look at all these structures that are high up. Your eye keeps getting pulled up to the top. You can't resist it because you have this high contrast priest who's going, what up? What up? Doing this shit up there, right? But look at all this strong use of verticality. I love this. Beautiful designs. This actually, I wouldn't be surprised if this was inspired by one of Sargent's paintings of that woman wearing that beautiful big veil with the white fabric. I can't remember the name of the painting. It really makes me think of that. Lighting too is gorgeous. Again, some more architectural. This makes me think of Tyler's work. <laughs> Tyler Edlin. Yeah, I could see him do that, no problem. Again, getting into some design motifs, some elegant design motifs. This helps to inform the design. The shadow karja. Now, they are a subsect of the karja. They're a darker, more underground thing. So we still need to make that visual design form aesthetic association with them. And we still maybe need to get that red, but now that they're the shadow karja, notice that a lot of those reds have been muted in blues. We have mixed purples, why? Because purple is blue plus red, right? So it's cooling down that red, making it less vain, making it more a little bit more roguelike and underground. Again here, predominantly blue with accents of red. And we can see this throughout the piece, but we still get that very iconic Karja type of bird-like design with the lion mane, very proud, very beautiful, gorgeous. God, these designs are so, damn, it's such a gorgeous game. Then we get into the Osram, and the Osram are kind of the tanks. They're brute heavy. Their main material of use is iron. Everything's made of iron. And this is where I really start to really dig uh, uh, Jan Bart, who, who, who directed this piece. It's iron, it's leather, it's natural materials, it's tanky, but it's still elegant. It makes me think a lot of the dwarves, where even though the dwarves are tanks, they're still very aesthetic. They're still a beauty. You walk into a dwarven art place, you're not just sitting there looking at some square stone structure, there's beautiful, elegant design and, 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 and aesthetics that go into it. So it's really beautiful stuff, but you can see a little bit more tanky, right? Yeah, that's it. You can feel that. Yeah, Scots and the fighters, bastards. You can see that. You can kind of see that in their design. I love that. Oh, yeah. They're also tinkers. So, again, when you think of the word tinker, that immediately makes you think of gnomes, goblins. It makes you think of little these little huts and structures with anvils and, and forges where there's smoke and stuff like that coming out. So notice to keep that tanky aesthetic, there's no 
fiddly bits. Everything's very <laughs> compact, very aerodynamic. You can tell if there's a hurricane, this won't even, nothing, nothing. The tiniest little chimney right there. So again, getting into the props, getting into archways, using, using iron and wood together. Then we have the bandits. The whole idea, the whole design aesthetic behind the, the bandits was that they were, they were parasitic. They would take over, they would, they would raid a certain area and take it over. So they were slobs and they were disrespectful to different things. And if you, again, look at, the, look at their design aesthetic. Look at how everything's kind of decayed. Look at their posturing. They're not again just standing there in their costumes going, I'm a bandit. Like this makes me think of the, the rider for the Haradrim in Lord of the Rings who are riding the, the Oliphant. And you remember that scene in it where, he, where, the, where the Oliphant is swiping across with his huge tusks, just taking out hordes of humans, just woof. And this guy's up in the, he's up in the thing, he's going, oh, it's kind of like this bloodlust thing. And he's kind of like, oh, he's loving it. Well, that, there's your expression. He probably tapped into the Haradrim type of posturing, the bloodlust, <laughs> give me kind of thing. Right? This is brilliant. This is another design choice by Jan Bart that I really, really love. Where the anthropomorphize, i.e. humanize machines to give you a sense of empathy. And what they've done is they've made it look like they've trapped these machines. These machines are animals, essentially. And they're gutting it. They're skinning the machines. But these are mechanical machines, but they're just through the use of paint and wires. Isn't that damn cool? I love that idea. It, they've created fabric. He added fabric hanging off of these scraps of, of beasts to, to, to simulate hanging flesh off of animals that they've skinned. That's freaking cool, man. Yeah. Cool. And I want to end on this. This is where purpose meets design. They started with the design of this tall, impressively tall creature. When you see a tall neck for the first time in the game, you're like, oh my God. God, what the hell is that thing, right? You see it on big screen, it's like, whoa, -ho! it's pretty impressive stuff. They, they were trying to figure out what purpose to give these tall necks because they took up so much real estate in the game. They were such huge creatures that they couldn't put anywhere. So they decided to make the tall neck a kind of focal point. Getting, climbing to the top of this tall neck was a really big endeavor. So when you got, finally got to the top, it kind of unlocked a part of the map, very similar to the towers in, in Breath of the Wild where when you got there, it would unlock a part of the map and give you a good vantage point on the rest of the landscape, which is absolutely freaking brilliant. So when you'd see these tall necks, you would, you would spot them from 10 miles away because they were so incredibly huge. And as you approach them, they just tower higher and higher and higher. So they're not only gorgeous and impressive, but they served a very important purpose. So you can see where sometimes design drives purpose and sometimes purpose drives design. And from an artistic perspective, you come in at whatever angle works best for you. And if you find that a certain angle is stunting you artistically, it's holding you back, try flipping the tables and taking it from the different direction. Think of function and then think of how that you apply a form to it. And if that doesn't work, think of form and how you can apply function to that. And this game is a perfect marriage of these two uh, uh, elements. And it's for all of these reasons that I find that Horizon Zero Dawn honestly sits on my, on my shelf as one of the most beautiful, visually beautiful games that I've ever played. And not only that, one of the best examples of artistic direction. If you haven't had a chance to play the game, it's a blast. It's probably cheap now and it's literally gorgeous. So if you got yourself a new 4K TV, I suggest playing this on it. You're gonna, you're gonna appreciate the fact that you got a nice gaming TV. With that said, hopefully you enjoyed today's art book discussion. I had a lot of fun. This is definitely one of my new prized possessions on my bookshelf. And happy painting. Take care.